So, part one of my epic to help you to do your homework, but most importantly, to help you finish off uh, the Anglo-Saxon and Norman unit. And part one is all about Anglo-Saxon England and the Norman conquest. So, who governed Ingl Anglo-Saxon England and how? Well, ultimate power rested in the hands of the king. You would say that the king had absolute power, Edward the Confessor. He couldn't do everything himself, of course, so um, he had earls, very, very powerful earls, um, who controlled the country on his behalf. Um, so they were lower down the chain, there were thanes who acted as shire reeves. And they ruled through being handed writs with the information the king needed, and they made sure that those laws and those uh, taxes that were carried, those laws were carried out in the, uh, or followed in the in the country, but also the taxes that the king wanted were collected. So there we go. King had absolute power, but he had other people to do things for him. How did law and order work in Anglo-Saxon England? Well, we've already mentioned one of those things. The Shire Reeve was often in charge. He had the hundred courts. Um, and the Shire Courts. Now, the Hundred Courts uh, was often the court that the Shire Reeve would judge over. The Shire Courts would be the Earl. And the, the seriousness of the crime depended which court you went into and also how important you were. So, a peasant farmer's very unlikely to be in the Shire Court, whereas a Thane is very likely to have been in a Shire Court. Um, and there's trial by ordeal, trial by jury. Uh, you might remember Vergilds and Tithings. You know, Vergild was the blood feud um, money. To stop a blood feud, you could pay something to the victim's family. Uh, a Tithing, collective responsibility. So the Tithing was when you were 12. You got put into a group of 10 and you were supposed to be collectively responsible for the uh, behaviour of those people in your Tithing. How did the economy work in Anglo-Saxon England? And remember, this is all a whistle stop, stop tour. There's more detail in some of my other podcasts, but effectively, it was largely a subsistence economy in that people usually just grew and grew and produced enough for them to get by. However, in some areas where people were lucky to be able to produce or have more than they needed, uh, they developed a, an exchange economy where very often people would swap and barter for goods. For example, you might be lucky enough to have grown more crops than you needed that year. You go to market with your crops and you might swap them for some clothes. Um, so often in the towns would be where this exchange economy developed. Um, and market day was the most important day in any town's economic calendar, in any town full stop. Um, so yeah, the economy went like There were exports and imports as well. Um, and that's why towns like London grew, because it was on a place in a, a port town on a huge river, the Thames, so things people could travel abroad and then up the river, and things could be exported and imported from there. Um, what reasons can you give for the succession crisis? One, the indecision of Edward. He may well have promised William the throne in 1051. He sent for somebody to go and look for one of his relatives, um, and that relative happened to die when he landed in England, but his son, Edgar the Atheling, who you should have heard of, and remember, he was around and by 1066, and that suggested he wanted a relative at that point, in, that was in the 1050s, when he sent somebody to look for a relative. And then, of course, on his deathbed, he named Harold Godwinson. Um, so this, this is indecisive from Edward. What else have we got? Well, you could point to the ambition of uh, William and Harold, and Harold had rather, or Godwinson had rather, their individual ambitions, uh, if there'd only been one of them with that ambition, there wouldn't have been a crisis, perhaps, because that one person would have taken the throne, job done. The lack of heir that Edward had is really a huge one. If he'd have had a son, tradition suggested that that would have been the most likely heir. Not definitely, because nothing was set in stone, um, but likely, which brings me to another one. There were no clear rules on the English succession. Um, if there had been, like if there is no son, this would happen, then it would have made it less likely for that to occur. Um, and what else have we got? Well, England was a rich and fertile land, is one of them we could have. The people wanted to be king of England. Uh, the nature of Harold's coronation was another one. He, he rushed it and it made it appear like he felt he was less legitimate as a king. What else have we got? What happened in the rising against Tostig? 
Well, Tostig became Earl of Northumbria, 1055 to 1065. He was a southerner, effectively. You know, northerners disliking southerners. That's not news, is it? Um, and Tostig actually uh, went into the north to try to sort it out because it was the most lawless place. It's not coincidence that blood feuds were more likely to be evident in Northumbria than in Mercia or Wessex. Um, but the Northumbrians didn't like being told what to do by this by this southern and by Tostig, so they rose up against him and appealed to uh, Morcar, whose brother Edwin was Earl of Mercia, and they appealed to Morcar to take over. Now, this put Edward in an, uh, and Harold Godwinson in a really difficult position, because they had to decide, do we support Tostig? Edward's favourite Godwin was probably Tostig, according to the sources at the time. For Harold, it was his brother, um, Harold being Earl of Wessex and named by people at the time as Subregulus. It was being called Deputy King. There was no position of Deputy King. That's just what people were calling him at the time. Um, sort of in written documents, they referred to him as Subregulus. So Harold Godwinson's really powerful. Edward's really powerful. And Tostig's been rebelled against. Do they support him or don't they? And they chose not to support Tostig. So Tostig was probably really annoyed and left the country. Um, and instead they agreed that Morcar could be Earl of Northumbria. In doing so, they avoided potentially a civil war between North and South. Potentially, who knows? Um, but certainly avoided further trouble because the North stopped rebelling, Marca was in charge, and things went back to normal. Um, but then, of course, it was to have consequences because where did Tostig go? Norway, to convince Harold Hardrada to invade. Um, what was Harold's embassy to Normandy? So, it's a bit of a I'm not so sure about this whole embassy idea. I don't, I'm not sure I really believe it. It was an embassy, because that suggests he meant to go there. Whereas I think it was probably an accident that he ended up in Normandy. Um, but anyway, the story goes, Harold Godwinson ended up in Normandy either on purpose or by being shipwrecked. He first was in the um, castle of somebody called Guy of Pontiau, and Guy... Um, his lord was William so he gave over Harold Godwinson to William William must have known that Harold Godwinson fancied the throne for himself so he, he kept William uh, sorry he kept Har Harold took him with him to do battle with somebody, he knighted him now you don't knight somebody who's higher than you in the chain, that's just weird um, like for example in our country the queen knights people uh, knight thee, all that business so the fact that William had Harold knighted was really symbolic of William saying, I'm in charge here. Um, and he also got Harold Godwinson to swear an oath to him on religious relics. We don't know exactly what he was swearing. It's not recorded anyway, but we can surmise, guess, that it was probably to, for him to support William's claim to the throne. Hmm, what, who fought at Fulford and what happened? Well, 1066 starts. Uh, Edward dies in January. And Harold, Harold Godwinson's the one there. Pops the crown in his head, I'm king. Now, I think William's going to invade, so I better get ready. So he gets his troops, puts them on the south coast, and he keeps them there for most of the year. And then he gets to September, harvest time, he has to let his troops go back to the fields to, to get the crops in, or people will starve. And most of his army, remember, is the feared peasant army. So he does, he lets them go. And then he hears that the Vikings have invaded in the north. And he might not necessarily have even expected the Vikings at that time, um, but Tostig had gone and convinced Harold Hardrada to invade. So, up he marched, oh well, he set off to march actually um, after the battle or some point during the battle, but word went to Edwin and Morcar, who were already in the north, who went to intercept the Vikings. So the Battle of Fulford was Edwin and Morcar versus Harold Hardrada and Tostig. Vikings against the Anglo-Saxons, and the Vikings won. Edwin and Morcar managed to escape, but much of their army was absolutely slaughtered. The stream at Fulford was said to have been running red. So Harold Godwinson had to continue his march north, gathering men as he, as he went, and, and his idea was to march so quickly that he would catch the Vikings by surprise. So we're on to who fought at Stamford Bridge and what happened. Well, the Vikings didn't have their armour on, they were mostly sunbathing and relaxing when across the hill comes another Anglo-Saxon army. Um, one Viking on the bridge stopped them getting across for much of the day, but eventually 
They floated somebody underneath the bridge, stabbed him in the ghoulies and got across the bridge. And the Anglo-Saxons beat the Vikings. They were really tired. They'd marched almost the entire length of the country and then fought a battle. Some of them were dead and some of them were injured. And many of them had been the, the, the important huskarls in, in Harold's army. Which brings me on to the next reason, uh, thing. And the last one in this first section. Can you give four reasons why William won the Battle of Hastings and some key details of the battle? So, here we go. <clears throat> one, Harold's mistakes. Harold tried to copy what he'd done at Stamford Bridge at Hastings and he marched really quickly down to Hastings, or down to the south coast, to try to catch Har William off guard. William was not going to be caught off guard. Um, he was ready and waiting. He had scouts out. He knew exactly that Harold was coming when he was coming. That didn't work. So that was probably just about the biggest mistake that Harold Godwinson made. Because if he'd managed to like stop and collect an army, then he would have had, a, obviously, a bigger army. Um, more time to prepare, more time for his men to rest, and it would have turned up fresher and maybe a little bit larger, ready for battle with William. Um Another mistake that Harold made, you could argue he could have done more to stop his troops from leaving the hill and falling for the Norman feigned retreat, which we'll come to as well. Um, so William's great generalship is another thing. William managed to get Harold Godwinson to come to him quickly, which he really needed for the reasons I've just mentioned, and also William was fighting on foreign soil. You know, his army needed to be supplied, and it was in England. His home was across the sea. He needed to win quickly. So his first great decision was to burn and pillage the houses around the south coast, and the places in the towns, to get Harold to come to fight him quickly, which he did. And the second, perhaps, well, there's a number of things that he did, but the second big thing was the feigned retreat. Some of his men retreated, they ran off down the hill, some of the Saxons came off the hill, which they were in a really strong position on the top of that hill, they came off the hill to come and uh, chase after the Normans. Soon as they got off the hill, the Norman cavalry could take them out. Should all be sparking ideas in your head from, from lessons. So William was like, ah, this is a good idea. I think I will use this to my advantage. Ha, 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 ha. So his idea is, I'm going to send some of my men up the hill to go and fight. I'm going to tell some of them to pretend that they're, they're running away and go, ah, I'm down the hill. Hope that the Saxons follow. And that worked bit by bit over the battle. Some Saxons came off the hill and it wore down the Saxon shield wall to the extent that they ended up winning. Um, which brings me to another one. The Normans had more options. They had varied troops. Their, their composition of their army was more varied. They had cavalry. They had archers. They used the cavalry for the feigned retreat. When, when, this, when the Saxons got to the bottom of the hill, the cavalry took them out. Um, and the archers, they were firing into the Anglo-Saxons all day long. And actually, in the end, it was possibly an arrow in his eye that killed Harold Godwinson, which suggests those two things were quite important. But maybe the biggest one was luck. Harold Godwinson had all summer, um, and all year, in fact, preparing for this, this potential fight with William when the Vikings invaded. Um, and in fact, he had to fight you know, all year long and he ended up having to fight two battles at opposite ends of the country within three weeks of each other. That's so unlucky. It's not like the Normans and the Vikings could get on the phone and go, now, go. That can't have happened. The communication at the time was not so that they would have coordinated this. And why would they? You know, the, the Normans and the Vikings weren't allies in this. Um, so that was really, really unlucky. Another thing that was unlucky is he did put some ships in the English Channel to try to intercept the Normans. And there was a storm that damaged some, a lot of the ships and the fleet had to return to port to mend. So that storm was really unlucky because even if those ships had, had fought the Normans and lost, they would have taken out some of the Norman ships and therefore some of the Norman soldiers. Um, and the whole of the Battle of Hastings was such a close fought battle. It lasted all day and it was only right at the end that the Saxons lost. So all of these things, you know, little fine things that could have tipped the scale the other way. And there we go, that's the first section. Good luck. <laughs>